Improv Online. We are so excited about tonight. We're going to be talking about your stage presence, stage presence and how to make it a little bit better. If I could articulate well, it'd be even better. I'll just say hi. My name is Dale Borland. Hi, and I'm Cheryl Duick. Welcome tonight. I am so excited that we have these three fabulous people joining us tonight. We have Kevin Pauls, who's best known for his vocals. And I just learned he's a, like a rock singer as well as a southern oh, yeah. gospel singer. This is awesome. So yeah. we have him tonight, and he's a fabulous performer, um, stage presence guy. And we're so happy to have him here. Something about Kevin Pauls that people may not realize, he's, he's, he's performed with... Um, Gaither Vocal Band, Michael English, um, Steve Archer, Stephen Curtis Chapman, the list goes on and on and on. We also have Michelle Sim, who is an author, an author, I keep saying Arthur. Arthur! <laughs> an author. I haven't, I haven't met Arthur yet. <laughs> no, <they're laughs> a public speaker, a Bible teacher, a mm -hmm. mentor, a pastor. Did I miss anything? <laughs> well, you well, know well, what? I'm I mean, actually a singer, songwriter, and yes. recording artist as well. And part of your ministry has been to artists for a few decades, and it's been amazing to have your experience as a singer to impart upon others as well. So we're we'll hopefully going to get into more of that as well as we unpack this tonight. <laughs> yes. And last but not least, we have all the way from Florida, we have Tom Jackson, a world renowned performance coach who's joining us. He has worked with some amazing talent yeah. from all levels. Um, some of the names he's worked with, Taylor Swift, Shawn Mendes, Lecrae, Jars of Clay, mm -hmm. Jordan Sparks. I it think I saw Phillips Paul. Craig Dean. Yeah, it goes to Kevin <laughs> Paul. Yeah. <laughs> the list goes on. Kevin Sim Paul's, Michelle yeah. Smith. The list yeah. goes on. <laughs> and on and on. <laughs> Tom, we are so happy to have you with us. <laughs> So yeah, thank you guys once again. It's just incredible to have this amazing amount of talent in one panel. We're really looking forward to this. Um, we do have an opening question for you that might just uh, set the stage. What's the reason for learning more about your presentation? As we're talking about um, you know, being better at your presentation, why would you want to do that? To be better? <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, uh, coming from where I'm coming from, I would say that you want to do that because you want to have an effect on more people. Mm. And uh, that's what I wanted to do. So it's not even so much the size of the crowd. So I've never mm. had big crowds like, like Tom's uh, artists or, or Kevin, but if you can affect, uh, you know, a hundred people or 20 people or whatever, then you're going to have a huge effect. So for me, it's all about effectiveness. Tom met, uh, Tom introduced me to his whole, idea of what he does probably close to 30 years ago and and one of the things he always said was if you want to do this for a living if you want to do this for real almost every artist out there makes 90 percent or more of their income from the live show right so if you just make great music but have no idea how to connect with people live it doesn't mean anything so you need somebody like tom to take a look at what you do because if you don't you're just going to make good records and probably work at starbucks the rest of your life oh wow <laughs> well, uh, by the grace of god and i mean this um i i might have i i might have spoke to more independent artists in the last 20 years than anyone and one of the things that and i'm not the sharpest tool in the shed as they say in the south but after a while you uh, even a rock could start figuring this stuff out. And I'm just a little sharper than a rock. Um, I believe there's four reasons, and talking to everybody, there's four reasons we do this. One is the music. This is no particular order, folks, so don't spiritually judge me. One is the music. We, we who do music are, have a thing in our DNA that, uh, you know, some people in, in the evening just immediately go home, watch TV or do whatever. Others will go work on music or play music or listen to music. Music is a big part of their life. So the first reason we do this is music. The second is, if we're, if we're Christian, if Christian artists, is the message. Hmm. I mean, that's the deal. There's nothing, there's nothing bigger than that. Though I love the music, I don't want to say just as much, but just as much in, in, in its own way. Mm. music the message the third thing is kevin was talking about if you want to make a living this is where the money comes from um and then the last part would be what i call me so music message money and me 
and me meaning fulfilling your calling. And, and the only place that ever comes together is on the stage. It doesn't happen in the studio. It doesn't happen, and you know, you sit around the studio a lot. What kind, of, what kind of ministry happens in the studio? Well, you might, you know, lead the, the, the engineer to the Lord or, you know, plant a seed or something. But basically, you stand on that stage, you get to do your music, bring your message, God willing, make some money doing it because you've touched people, you've created moments, and, and you fulfilled your calling. And that's why I think people who have those innate things, that, that that's the reason they want to do it. That's why they should get better. You touched on a key word there, Tom, creating moments. And that's the big part of what you, you talk about when we're talking about presentation. Uh, could we maybe take that as far, maybe one of our first little things of tool for the tool belt? So uh, maybe, um, maybe we'll take one at a time. Michelle, could you speak to maybe what, 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 about the, what moments can you as an artist create? <clears throat> well, uh, again, because I'm both a speaker and a singer, um, the first time I met Tom in 1992, I think it was, um, the, there was something that he said that somehow got imparted into me. And I, uh, I just, uh, I, I had this thing happen that, um, you know, even when he did the chart, he's got a chart that you do, but I've been able to take what Tom downloaded somehow in me that day. And again, it was God. Uh, was that I use the method of the chart he actually creates in everything I do. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a Zoom meeting, whether mm -hmm. it's a live speaking presentation, I have all those elements that he teaches and it works. It yeah. just yeah. works. And so that's what I would say. There is a, there is a methodology that works. And if you want the people to get what uh, you came to give them, uh, then that works. And so that, that's what I would say. But I use, I use the same method in everything. So, you know, he, he talks about, you know, you start here, here. Then you have this funny moment. So I wrote this song called Stranger Things Have Happened, but I don't know where. I get people up out of the audience. We dance. We do hoedown stuff. And then I hit them with what I came there to tell them. So it's a method I use for everything. How, how would I would explain to somebody what a moment is? I would call it an emotional connection mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with people. And, and that has all, it all has to do with the arrangement of the song, how you deliver the song. Visually, uh, what most people think when we talk about performance is movement. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, in my world, I spend, boy, if I spend 25% of the time, maybe 30% of the time on it, that's it. The other time has to do with uh, creating that moment, rearranging the song, working on music, musicality things um see people go to experience moments they don't go to hear songs they think they go to hear songs but they go to experience moments the, the moments inside those songs move them and this is where if you want to be crass this is where you generate revenue because people will go back to your table and say where's that song here's what they're saying where, where's that song about this but really what they're saying is, where's that song that made me feel this way because I want to feel that way again? Mm. And so the buyer CD, that kind of thing. So it's an emotional connection. And, and in most cases, most artists, all, every artist I've ever seen, and I'm being really generous here, has a moment. Somebody has had that moment sometimes, uh, you know, an older artist had that same moment for 20 years, but they don't know how to create any of the other moments. Mm, exactly. It, They've gone through it and they know how to say that particular portion. Yeah. Well, or, or just there's one song that just happens to be created. Oh. You know, I've, had, yeah. I've, by the grace of God, you know, I mean, I remember listening when I first worked with Jars of Clay, and they had the song called Flood. Mm -hmm. And the song itself just creates a moment. You don't have to do anything. But the other 10 songs on the record, ooh, what do we do with those? So we got to create moments out of them. And, and inside those songs are moments waiting to be cracked open. But most people don't crack them open. They just play the songs, wing it, and hope something good happens. And here's the problem with that, is every once in a while, something good happens. <laughs> it's like magic happens. The planets align, the spirit falls. You can actually hear the monitors. It's magical. <laughs> And, and then, but here's the problem. If you did that show and it was magical and, and three hours later you did another show and it doesn't work, 
here's the problem. You don't know why it didn't work and it did the first time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's what my method is about is, is understanding why it worked and why it doesn't work. I want to hear from Kevin about the moments, but I wanted to get a little bit more on what are some of the elements of creating a moment? Are, are you, can you expand on that a little bit? What you want to do, the, boy, start getting into, you take a song, let me just take a song. Like I said, some songs create moments by themselves. And, and now we're talking, keep in mind, this, let me back up one little bit and say, this is about the audience. This is not about you getting excited, you getting emotional, you tearing up, you feeling all this emotion. Not that that's bad, but if they don't get it, you lose. I may love my wife, but if she doesn't get it, we're in trouble. So moment inside a song are what what you want to do is look at a song and develop two things you want to develop themes inside those songs there are themes rhythmic themes melodic themes um uh, harmonies uh, all kinds of cool stuff going on in that song that the audience doesn't know about particularly because most of the people we're talking to here are not married to their audience. When Taylor comes out and starts singing, 20,000 people or 120,000 people jump to their feet and start mm -hmm. singing along. Right. You come out and start singing and they do this. <laughs> Impress me. They're trying to figure out if they like you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you are dating your audience. So what you've mm -hmm. got to do is understand the, the mentality of dating your audience versus being married to your audience. So inside those songs are themes that need to be cracked open. So you need to develop themes and characters. And characters is you. You, you're the character. How do we develop this, this thing so my personality comes out in the show? Because people come to see people, not just hear music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. When, when I first started listening to Tom back in the early 90s, I was touring with tracks. There's nothing worse than A, I had tracks. I didn't have a studio or an ability to translate and, and shift those tracks. So I listened to Tom intently about the transitions. I needed to create moments within the song mm -hmm. as much as I could, but I was limited. I now had to try to figure out how can I set up the song or how can I talk out of the song that captures people so that there's a moment that makes sense. I was locked in with a stupid track that would go from here to three minutes and 30 seconds and would stop. And it was the same every night. I had to try to figure out how to create something because I, mm. I didn't have the money or the ability to go in the studio and re rearrange the song like I would have if I had a band. Explain that though. It's, well, explain that. Nowadays you can it's way cheaper te technologically to go in there. For example, at the beginning of a song like Kevin's talking about, beginning of a song, you've got a really cool little intro. And, and since we record with radio in the back of our minds, right. the song is like what Kevin said, three minutes, 30 seconds long. The intro is what? Eight to 11 seconds at the most. Well, when you play live, you don't need an eight to 11 second intro. In fact, if you come out with eight to 11 second intro, your audience is even with you till the second verse. So what you want to do is develop that introduction. You may chat over the introduction, which means you've got to edit the song if you have a track. If it's a live band, way easier. Right. But, but, but nowadays, even with Taylor, Sean, anybody, they're all using tracks now too behind it. And so part of the rehearsal is going in and say, wait, 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 let's, so I, I get rid of the track. We play it live. It doesn't sound quite as good, but that's where I make the adjustments with the, then we go back and edit the track to fit the, uh, the length of, length of uh, what it should be. So three, yeah. Yeah. Well, see, most people things. think if, if somebody were talking to you right here said, you got 20 minutes to play tomorrow night. The first thing everyone watching this will, will do is go, how many songs can I cram in? Mm, mm. And it's a mistake. Yeah. It's like going into a restaurant and saying, how much food can I eat in 20 minutes? Well, again, we come, I, we come back to a lot of what you said because what I know for my performance over the last 30 years is, is what I learned from Tom. 
and and you always use the analogy and i think i love this analogy it's of goulash and most music hits people like this whole plate of tons of great food and nobody can pick out what it is especially live I don't know if you've ever been to a live show where there's more than one guitar player. Somebody does a solo. It takes you a few minutes to figure out who's even playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that taking our time and understanding that every song needs to be stripped down and reproduced live so that people know what's going on. They're going to understand, oh, this, the stage placement of a solo means everything. That's a moment. But if everybody's standing at the back of the stage and they're playing, you spend half the solo trying to figure out who's playing, and then you're probably not even interested anymore. Songs can create moments, and the transitions can also, especially if you have tracks, you have, you have to create your own moment. You were just talking a little bit about transitions, and I, I think yeah. one of the things that, that you can pick up real quickly is whether a, uh, whether a band is a pro or they're amateur, and maybe that's not, that's maybe a bit of a mean distinction, but it really, it really is true. A band that knows how to go from song to song really makes a difference. There's a lot of great bands that figured out how to do the song well, and then they look very, very unorganized, unplanned. And, and I think that's a huge piece. You can really tell. I went and saw Toto last October at the Ryman in Nashville. It was an incredible show. And watching these guys, not only the show, but you're just watching everything. They knew what was going on. Yeah. And there's a huge difference between the band that plays and they look at each other, what are we doing next? And that happens often. Or, you know, they're writing it out five minutes before you go out on, on stage. Instead of a show that's been rehearsed and planned and worked for a, the next song to mean something, going to the other ones, there's themes, there's... There's musicality that, that cross over. There's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think most people don't think of the reason for the show. They just play music and hope it works. And that doesn't create moments. It doesn't create confidence in the audience to even look at you properly. They're, they're always nervous half the time. And I think we do that a lot. We just hope, I can sing really well. I hope that translates. And it, it doesn't always translate well. So let, let me add this for probably the majority of your audience here tonight, because Probably, maybe may, most of the people that are listening would never be in a position of having a live audience and to have uh, full-time musicians that actually know what they're doing and stuff. So for someone like myself and using this, this method of creating, uh, you know, basically always Tom says, first song is like a, we a waster. They're going to check you out. They want to see what you're wearing. They're going to see whether they think you, they like you and I, and all that. So, so you, there's creating moments, even using tracks. Mm -hmm. um, because maybe that's sometimes that's all anybody has. So I managed to do that. Now I've also managed to <laughs> learn to play keyboard enough that when I do my funny song, I'll actually go over to a keyboard and all <coughs> I can do is chord guys. That's all I can do. And I can, uh, sing well enough and I'm not a great singer like Kevin or a lot of my friends and I can sit down and I can create a, a moment that they do, they want to buy my books they want to buy my CDs all that kind of stuff because all of a sudden they 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 know I love them because I'm I'm giving something to them and so there there's that aspect too so I learned keyboard enough and this is another very very important thing your best friend that night is the sound man when you've only got tracks so, for instance, I've had some great sound men that I've been able to work with, and uh, Cheryl's husband is one of them. And I write out, I don't, I don't show up 10 minutes ahead of time and hand the guy a bunch of tapes and go, oh, I don't do that. And it's really what Kevin's talking about doing a live thing. I make sure that I give him a very well-written script of exactly what I'm going to do when I need uh and tracks to go back to back when I need a break, uh, and when I'm going to need another microphone, when I bring someone up on stage. And so to me, the sound man is, is well, I mean, they're, they're the most important anyway, but if all you've got is tracks and all you've got is limited income, uh, you can, it can still be a great night. So I would just want to say that make sure that the sound man or the sound lady has got a very well written out script of exactly what you want to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's important. Well, yeah. That's a very good point considering well, I'm a track singer too. So I'm, I'm very curious as, as you know, Kevin, you mentioned about singing with tracks and Michelle, now you've just said it. 
I'm curious for us track singers, how do you create moments? What are some things, what are some ideas that we could use to kind of create moments with our audience? What have you done? I'll give you one. Take, take, take a, uh, you should do this, every person listening to this, almost every person should do this. Take a chorus that is awesome in your songs. Let's say you're doing nine songs in your show. Uh, take a chorus before the track starts, take it out of time and sing it a cappella and, and nail it. And it doesn't have to be Celine Dion, CC Winans, a cappella. Uh, it could be Bob Dylan a cappella, <laughs> meaning, uh, uh. but take it out of time and then let the track start. Particularly if the song is um, poignant lyrically. That way you can ensure that the, the audience can hear the lyrics. Another thing is just what Michelle said, and this would be a challenge, and I've challenged everybody I ever work with um, to stretch themselves. Mm. Instead of, when I ask you, let me ask you, have you ever played an instrument? Ever? Me? Yes. 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 Yeah. What is it? Drums, percussion, uh, xylophone, all that kind of stuff. Have you ever just sat in, uh, on a, uh, well, xylophone, let's take that. My point is this, you, you strip the song down. Michelle talked about a graph I've got. There's a set list that I, I work off of. And you strip it down and take and, and stop the track and do something as simple as it can be even. You, a lot of people listen to this and go, oh, I can't do that because on the CD, it sounds awesome. And you've hired some really cool piano player, some really cool guitar player or something, and you can't play like that, so you won't play it. But just the change of pressure on your audience will suck them into it. Mm -hmm. Because here's the deal. Your songs, communication is 55% uh, what the audience sees with their eyes. 30% tone or emotion, and this is always freaky to uh, Christian artists, 15% is the content. So if your songs, if you're going to do, if you're going to make a living doing this, if you're doing 50 minutes, 45 minutes an hour, do all your songs sound the same? And the, the answer should be no. Hopefully no. Hopefully. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. You have a bad producer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, meaning the instrumentation changes. It can't be ballad after ballad after ballad after ballad. That's like going into a restaurant, and and I don't care. You guys have Ruth Chris Steakhouse in in. Uh, yeah. What, what what where'd you take me the one time? A really good steak, Kevin. Um, uh, the keg. Okay, so if we went into the keg steakhouse, sat down and ordered a steak, and all they brought us was their best steak. After five or six bites, we want something else. Yeah. We need to change the pressure on it, whether it's a salad, whether it's a drink, whether it's bread, whether. So we have to go somewhere else, both, both musically and visually. And so even if the salad, meaning sitting at a keyboard, dinking on a piano, isn't that good, the change, the change of pressure, when you go back to what you do well, it's going to mean more. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it becomes a Chinese water torture. The same thing, the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. And, and that's why by the fourth song, people start checking out, even mm -hmm. if you're really, really good. And if, now, you've, got, if you've got tracks, one of the most, one of the most um, frustrating things for an audience as well is when you've got a 30-second musical interlude in your track mm -hmm. and you had no way to, to break <laughs> that up until you're going... Took you I don't know what to do here. So <laughs> I, I sat down with Tom many years ago and he, so we worked out a couple of tunes that had that for me. And I, I brought, brought in either a scripture that was relevant or mm -hmm. a small little story that led in. But yeah. the biggest thing that happened when I did stuff like that is my body didn't look tense anymore. Mm -hmm. Cause in those musical interludes, half the time you look like, oh crap, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Now the audience starts praying for you. They're concerned, <laughs> they're not enjoying anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I even started, I saw, I saw a couple of artists do this and I tried it. I saw John Gibson, do you remember John Gibson? I do. 
he was incredible. And he would always pretend he was playing a sax or some instrumentation. I went, I can do that. And I took a chance. And there was a couple of times I did a fake air guitar. I joke around with the pastor or something. And they laughed in the middle of my interlude. And by the time they were done laughing and we all enjoyed ourselves, I was back singing the song. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a small little thing, but those moments of awkwardness lose you time and lose you connection. And anytime you can avoid having those bumps in the road, they just, and especially as a track artist. I mean, I did, I did 15 years with straight tracks, 150 shows a year. That was brutal. Mm -hmm. It was the best education I ever had in my life trying to figure out how to connect with an audience with tracks and me. That's a huge deal. That's a, and that's a very, very, it's not fun to do. But once you get it, you realize there's differences when you feel comfortable and you've made moments within those spaces that it's not so bad. If somebody, to me, if somebody's serious, and, and this is not in 100%, but this is, if somebody's serious about doing this and that's all they have is tracks, you go in and you fix some of those things if you can. Today you can, you can like for example, uh, let's say you've got a really couple really touching songs uh, lyrically. Now some of you are thinking, well, my songs are touching lyrically. <laughs> First of all, that's a mistake. You should have a fun song. You should have a, a celebration song. You should have... But there's sometimes there's just a ministry moment or two that need to happen, and if you can even strip the track down, so you go back in, you say, "Listen, pull out the orchestra, pull out the uh, uh, you know the big drums, and make it just an acoustic and a piano thing." And you sit down on a stool. Now comes the visual: what should the song look like? And then you sit down. You sit down for a couple songs. The audience sits down with you. They listen more. And when you're standing and doing the same thing, they expect you to do something because you're standing. So do something. But if you do the same thing over and over, you're back to Chinese water torture. What if someone is, it plays an instrument? Maybe they just play keyboard or maybe they just play acoustic guitar. What advice would you give them? They're not playing the track necessarily, but they, they have an instrument, but that's all they have, one instrument. Uh, play a couple tracks. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, singer songwriters are the worst for this because it, a really true singer songwriter is so artistic. You want to just shake them every once in a while because they go, "Dude, my music doesn't go like that. Like this is the way I played. It's just me. I've got to be authentic." Well, use a fun song. If you have a bunch of, like you said, play a track, change things up. But often they're going like, no, man, that's just the way it's supposed to be, just guitar vocal. You know, a Canadian artist that's really good at this, guys, as most of you know, I was doing something called Church at the Moonshine, which for you Southerners, yes, is a bar. Um, <laughs> and, and then I would bring a, a, a Canadian artist in to perform that night, is our Jacob Moon. Yeah. Um, Jacob is mm -hmm. just a master of just, um, you know, doing it really simple and then using all that looping stuff that he uses. Yeah. You know, I mean, I couldn't even begin to think of doing stuff like that, and nor do I need to, because it's not what I do. But I, I tell you what, I, you know, so it's great. Moments. I'd like to ask somebody one question, maybe it's Tom, but where do you get those tracks that you can take things in and out of? There's a thing called Pro Tools. When I first started doing this 30 years ago, mm -hmm. it was like a $30,000 program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now it's like 30 bucks. Now I'm being facetious a little bit, but and you can go in and it can run for your computer. You can pull out the guitar. You can pull out. You can extend. You yeah. can extend the intro instead of doing it once, and and you can extend the intro four times. Whatever you want to do, mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. figure out. I'm going to say this. I'm going to quote this scripture, and you time it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and and over the music that will save some awkwardness too, because after every song, if it's dead air. It's awkward, but if you have a little dinking going on or music, but I want to go back real quickly to the singer songwriter thing, if you don't mind. Sure. And I, this is a shameless plug, and it's not even out now, but I just, I've just finished editing a singer songwriter DVD series. And I put like 10 different artists up on stage and we, we I show you what a rehearse, it's, it's not the fastest moving DVD series I've got. 
but I show you what a rehearsal should look like and what we're fishing for, how to, how to pull out those moments by extending something, by, um, by looping, by somebody. Listen, I have people that say, oh, I just play guitar. And I said to them, just what I said to you, have you ever, ever in your life played a keyboard? Yeah, but, but yeah. And now they're playing two songs on the keyboard to change the pressure. And they have, and the beautiful part about being a singer songwriter is you have more control than over oh, than a track. You can extend something, you can chat over something, you can stop in the middle and say, so here's what I'm saying. And then you can go back to the song. Versus where a track, you can't go, <laughs> <laughs> stop. But there are, this becomes a musical thing oftentimes. Your transitions, your storytelling, um, some of the tools you use. Um, I stole this from Daniel Lenoir, anyone? know who Daniel Lin was? I know you do. You two do. He produced you two, Bob Dylan. Uh, he's a Canadian guy. And I saw this years ago, and I used it in my workshop. Um, he uses video screens, except the video screens are balloons, weather balloons. And he pumps up the weather balloon, puts them up behind him, and projects onto the screen just his guitar playing that happens on the guitar. And then at the end of the night, shh, puts him in his pocket and walks away. Now, and you get a you get a $99 projection screen. The question is, how bad do you want it? You, now, some of you watching this will go, well, I'm gonna put everything on the projection screen then, like Sunday morning service. And that's a mistake. And I, I don't wanna get into that. That's a Chinese water torture. But, but you could use it for background lighting, sure. you can yes. some, some stuff up, you can do a loop, you can play a different instrument, you can play a track. There's all kinds of things that you can do. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sorry I get excited about this, but after 30 years of doing this, it still yeah. excites me. I think, I think bottom line, this is it. And I know Kevin has invested a lot. I've invested a lot. And I know, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know who's watching, but I'm sure lots of people have. I think one of the mistakes spiritually we make that we think that if God has moved upon you with this gift and that, uh, you know, you need to go and do it, that it's going to be simple. It's going to be easy. It's not easy. But you know what? If you want to do the will of God, if you want to accomplish your call, it's going to take effort like anything else. It's mm -hmm. like parenting, guys. It takes effort. It's it like marriage. It takes effort. This is not going to just be easy. easy. There's going to be investments you're going to have to make, and there's going to be time. You know, if you just show up and do your thing, and then you'll you'll blame somebody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of human nature. So we we need to take this seriously and uh, do what we need to do to make it happen well. That's a good segue, Michelle. Thank you, because uh, Tom has made available to our viewers a special offer, and I wanted to just let everybody know. The special offer is this. Um, basically, this the any any of Tom's materials and webinars are now are going to be available to our viewers at twenty five percent discount of the already discounted price. So, if you want to know how to get that discount, limited time only. Limited time only, only for the month of July till July the thirty first. After that, the the offer is gone. So, up right. to July thirty first, you can go on to. Um, Tom's website, which I'm going to give you in a few, bit, a few minutes. It'll, it's also at the link at the end of the video, too. Yes, which is on, on stage success. Did I say that right, Tom? I think on, so. Yeah, on, on stage success.com. Success. Yes. Um, and you will get a look down. Now, now, the only thing is, there is a code. There is a code to get the extra 25% discount. You will have to email or you have to go to our website, gospelmusicindustryhub.com, and <laughs> and subscribe to our, our on our little uh mailing list and we will send that code to you so you can get that 25 percent discount so as we're talking about being serious about what we're talking about this is an opportunity for you to invest in what we're talking about and make it practical and we believe it's going to help you not only as a performer but also as a musician uh to move forward and to grow if, if i might interject i'm not sucking up to tom he knows me better than that there is, there is nothing more um, important than investing in what you do. And too often, we're always hoping for a lottery win. And we're hoping that somebody will hear how good I can sing or hear how good I can play. 
And what Tom does in his video series, he teaches you how to make a living doing what you love. Mm -hmm. And if you don't invest in that is the, this, his video series and his training, I'm serious, is the only reason I'm full time in music business. The only reason I was able to leave my job and do this is because I knew how to do it on stage because he taught me. And so I'm not saying that because Tom's here because I tell everybody the same thing. If you want to learn how to do this well, better than anyone, there is nobody in the world that teaches it better than Tom does. So invest, start right now, invest in that. Because if you change the way you connect with people, it will change your career forever. Yeah, and I want to add to that too. Um, uh, again, because I'm not full-time music, but I'm full-time ministry. And so I've used, um, and, and I got to say the first thing I learned uh, when, uh, remember Tom, the first time I brought you up, I think it was 92, or, and we were at the Crossroads Center, and Tom didn't quite understand Canadians very well <laughs> at that time. <laughs> and it turns out we... We and the Australians are the toughest audiences in the world. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so hard to read, so, I know. Well, well, I'll tell you what, though, and he's realized this, they're hard to get. But when you got them, you got them. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they're just not pushovers, let's put it that way. But there's one thing uh, that Tom teaches that is in everything I do. It's probably in my heart anyway, but it affirmed it, is that his definition of performance is loving your audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the analogy he uses, dating your audience. It's that, that's exactly but, it. But if you want to spiritualize this, let's say if we want to say in Christ, mm -hmm. uh, we are to love one another. Mm -hmm. And we have a special opportunity as performers to do that in a very, very effective way and to really change people's lives. So this is serious business. And like I say, I use it in everything I do. So uh, it works. So I just wanted to add that on. And he Great. loves Canadians now. What? <laughs> Canadians. Yes, he loves Canadians now. Okay. Well, I, I, work with, I work with so many Canadians. It's unbelievable. I've got favor in Canada and I don't understand it, but I'll take it. Um, That's great. From mainstream artists, the Christian artists, on and on. But I will say this, uh, the DVD series, I, what people... I would, I would buy the book and the DVD series. In fact, I will say this. This is not a, a plug. In fact, I went in um, during this whole shutdown thing. I started watching my videos because I was going to edit them and make them better or get rid of some. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, I watched the All Roads Lead to the Stage DVD series, and it is, and it's 10 years old. You'll even see some references to MySpace on it. Wow. Um, but... It's, it was completely relevant because you're standing in front of an audience. It, it, it is what it is. It's, it's universal. But I also would buy the book, uh, the My Live Music Method. And those are the things that are the, you put those two together, you study them, you mark up the book, you watch it over and over, and, and you put it into practice. And I've never seen it not work. I will say this. Uh, and this is a shameless plug, but I really, what I'm, listen, I'm glad I did this for Taylor Swift. When I worked with Taylor, her f first part of her tour, she was playing her, her tour. She was opening for Brad Paisley. I got to work with her during the Christmas break before she went out for the second half. And we took the exact same songs and worked on them in the second half. And her merchandise went up 600%. Wow. Yeah. Now, now I, I was I was grateful and dang, I was I bummed that I didn't get a percentage of that. <laughs> but, oh, no, really, I was so stupid, so stupid. Mm. Um, but my point is, we have the gospel. Mm. We have the gospel. We there's you know Jesus says, look, 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 your your life is hidden in Christ. We need to bring people to the Lord. And if we just go up and sing songs and hope something good happens, I hope your pastors prepare on Sunday. I hope your pastors have gone to school for theology. I hope, you know, besides the calling, that's where it starts. Michelle's right. That's where it starts. You get the calling. But then you got to put in the work. And, and you know, people will go to... I, listen, I teach at Berkeley College of Music and all these different places. And some of these people are spending... 50,000 U.S. 
a year to go to this stupid place. And at the end of four years, they're two hundred thousand dollars, and they don't know how to perform. They know the op they know theory. They know how to sing better. They but they have no idea how to perform. I had the dean of of uh, Berkeley tell me this. He goes, "Dude, we need what you have because." They don't know how to go out and make a living. They understand all about music, but they don't know how to go out and make a living. Mm, wow. Think about Could, that, $200,000 later. Yeah, you that's crazy. Tell, tell the story, uh, Tom, and, and I think it's so relevant. I tell it all the time. There's an artist we know that was number one, had, had this great success, was going out on his own tour now. And you're talking about it six months to write the record, six months to record it, and, and three days in a garage to try to plan out his tour and wonders why he now is either a, a, you know, a sideman for another band or why it didn't work because he didn't spend the time to go into the fact that he had to relate and create fans. And he just thought his music was going to be good enough to do it. And nobody's is. It's funny you say that because I got a thing from him just the other day. He's now an insurance agent if I need insurance. And, and, he he was so talent, and he's so talented. Yeah. Yeah. That's a shame. And it makes me sad. It's, it's laughable, but it makes me sad. Now, just let's, let's go back into something else that we haven't really talked about. We're talking about song arrangement um, as far as uh, in, in the sense of a concert setting. I know that's something that Tom likes to, to, to preach at whenever we talk about creating those moments. You have the, the flow of your... So maybe some information that way would help... Um, uh, those who are maybe not really understanding what their songs to the best of their ability can do in a set. Uh, let's say you oh. have a, a long set or a short set. We'll talk about that. I'll go first. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's just it's something I took, I took away that from your class and seminar down in Nashville when I went down because it, 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 it kind of, when you have a short set, you've got to create those moments, have that, uh, that flow. And it just, it's incredible little tool. Well, yeah, Kevin, you can go ahead. So yeah. I was just going to say that you, you said it earlier when we, I had the privilege of working with Tom for about five or six years and, and everything I know from this, I sometimes sound like Tom because it regurgitates it because it, he just taught me so well. It's what I heard. But when people would say, I've got a showcase to do and I got 20 minutes, they'd instantly go, that's five songs. I could do five songs because they, they're thinking I'm going to do exactly what's on the recording. And it's, you know, I think it was during the time I was with you, you kind of stopped calling yourself a stage coach and a performance coach and started saying, I'm a live music producer. Because if you don't reproduce the music for the live setting, the rules are different. So you can stretch something, you can get a great groove and, and, and build it and, and build musical things that you wouldn't do in a record because it wouldn't make sense if you're driving down the road listening to it on the radio. So, I mean, mm -hmm. Tom will break it down a little bit more, but I think the idea is I've got a great song. There's a great groove. There's a great rhythm. There's maybe some great lyrics. How do I rip it apart, re-put it back together in front of people so that they are actually going to feel what I felt when I created it in the first place? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. So, so depending on how long you're playing, your, your radio song, you got one song, it's like a commercial or a trailer for a movie. A trailer for a movie, let's just take that. Or a commercial, doesn't matter. But it's bam, 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 it moves fast. You know, it's all the highlights. But now if, now if you're, a, we're moving into movies. If you're putting together a TV show that's 30 minutes long, it doesn't, it's, it can't sustain that bam, 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 bam for 30 minutes. You wear people out. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do, like I said earlier, is develop themes and characters. So, but, and then if you get a, create a movie, a whole concert, now you've got an hour, hour and a half. You can take them on a different journey. You just watch a TV show. I, I mean, I, I watch The Flash, filmed in Vancouver, by the way. Um, and and you watch it, it's a 30 minute or 44 minute thing. And, and because it's not a movie, they'll say something, the phone will ring, they'll pick it up immediately. And this is silly, but in a movie, they'd say something, walk to the door dramatically, the phone would ring, they turn around, and, and there's that space for a little bit of breath and stuff. So a, a concert needs to have that space hmm. so, that, so that people can 
land on it and 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 savor it like a great it's it's not fast food yeah you know hmm. so so you have to arrange your songs in a way um to do that but then now this is the way i like to do it and most of the clients i work with can do this we set up an hour hour and a half show then when someone says man i'm opening i got 20 minutes and then we can go in and go okay wait now we've got all these moments but we can't use them all which ones are going to be appropriate for this 20 minutes this 30 minutes this one song and and so now you can look it's like a baseball uh coach it's a game we play in the states <laughs> we get two when we can. All our hey, guys Amy, the Jays are the Jays are coming to the Rogers Dome to practice right now. So. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Yeah. I've got some Blue Jay games, and they won the World Series twice yeah, with American yeah. players. But um, but well, my point is, um, it depends on the situation. But if you've got the players on the bench, meaning the songs and the moments, then you can use your instinct. Mm. Yeah, I, I will say this to everybody listening to this. It is so much easier for me to put together a Taylor Swift show, a uh, Lecrae show, a Jesse Cook show, because, because we do the same thing, the same place on stage every single night. Anyone watching this can do that. If it takes 10 times for us to go over to get it, We'll get it because the audience doesn't know it took you 10 times and it took somebody else once. Exactly. All they know is that that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So, but you have got to adjust to one song here, four songs here, a full concert here. You've got, but you, if you don't have those moments, if you don't have those people on the bench, those songs worked up to where they're moments, then you're just, you're just winging it. You're just, mm -hmm. you're just winging it. So you've got to have, Oh, no. So some of your moments are opening moment, closing moment, fun moment, touching moment, musical moments, different moment. Those are the, the moments that need to go into a show to keep an audience back to the menu. You need, you need different things that cannot be. So many people that I watch, you know, like beautiful singers who sing gospel music and they just go off. And it's like, whoa, the first song, you're like, whoa, this is amazing. The second song, they go off and you go, whoa. Third song, they go off and you go, whoa. <laughs> Fourth song, you're going, is that, all the, is that all there is? Is that all there is? And, and the, the problem is, yes, because they haven't, they haven't brought the whole meal. They're just bringing mm. one kind of thing. And it's what I call a Chinese water torch. It's just the same thing over and over. And after a while, your audience starts checking out. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, you wonder sense. why, with the gift you've been given and the call you've been giving, you're not making a living doing this or mm -hmm. it's not being as effective as you want it to be. Or no, or nobody even wants you back. Yes. Right. You know, I was with, when I was touring with Bill Gaither, and I would say, I did this show here. And he, the first question out, did you get asked back? And how much product did you sell? <clears throat> Because he knew that was the tell, did you connect with people? That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That was the first thing he asked every single time I'd say that. He'd go, did you get asked back? And how much product did you sell? Because he knew if you connect, that's how people show they connected with That's true. Wow. Good stuff so, there. So how does that translate now? Like we've, we've, we've all been in COVID. We've all been kind of at home and some keen artists have been going online and kind of just doing their music online. How, how does all this translate? We've been talking about live performance, live on stage, live in front of an audience. How does this transform, translate when we don't have a live audience, when we only have a camera in front of us and we only hope that there are people watching us? Do we prepare the same way? Uh, does the moment creation is it the same I, I how do we how do we prepare what what are your thoughts on that I, I haven't enjoyed any of it until last night I saw Jennifer Hudson and Tom mm. I'd forgotten that you'd worked with her and she uh, she she did something quite spectacular it still didn't keep me watching because to me live is live and 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 the only other thing I want to say because we're running out of time is anything on internet right now guys I still hire people. I still do productions. I still do things. And I will not hire anybody who I hear saying hateful things on social media. And I think even that in this day and age, there's been so much stuff 
that people have very strong opinions about. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think it's smart. And I think we just need to be careful. So for instance, when, when I've hired somebody to do someone live, I need to be able to trust them. Because you can't haul someone off a stage live. I've only had maybe one or two times that that's happened, that I regretted hiring somebody. And so I, as somebody who hires people, I still watch that. That's all I'll say about that. Yeah, it's character above credentials. And that's something that a lot of people are very passionate about. I think COVID has shown the people that have done live well and have created fans <laughs> they're able to now engage with people that want to engage with them because there was an emotional connection somewhere in the past where they're now your rabid fans. I think that's, we've, you've seen the people that have those type of fans. And then you've also shown the people that are hoping that when things open up, everything will just magically happen. They're not preparing. They're not dreaming about what their show should be. They're not dreaming about how can I connect with people once I get, they're hoping like so many artists will say to me, I've been working so hard at this for like seven months. Why isn't it worked? This is, this is work like everything else. If we're in this situation where we can't be live, well, now's a great time to work your butt off mm -hmm. to figure out how can I create something that will meet a need in the future. And I get to love on people, create great music and tell them about my relationship with the creator live when that finally happens. And I think mm -hmm. we're seeing that there's not a lot of people that have the rabid fans and there's not a lot of people that are actually preparing. Those people stand out, the ones that are, are doing those things well. Just from a technique standpoint, um, the very, very similar things, just subtler because it's because it's in your face so a glance if i'm on stage I, like i watched the duo the other day um and they were really good musically and the guitar player was turned like this and his his partner which was a girl was sitting over here and they weren't even looking at each other till after after each song and, and there was no there was no connection and all they had to do was go just a little glance to each other and there had been an emotional connection like ooh something's going on there uh, where on stage if you know with it would be like yeah it would be bigger um, spacing is important even even in a, uh, a setting meaning uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a duo the, the duo I saw. Um, Personality is huge online. Uh, to me, in fact, I think personality trumps the music in some ways. Mm. Uh, talking about transitions, Kevin, you know, chatting with your audience and getting them to know you, that, that's the way to do it. And then you deliver some good songs. Instead, instead of which a lot of the artists did, they just crammed song after song after song. Yeah. And instead of chatting with the audience, interacting, that kind of thing, they... They just played music, said a few words, and off they went. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and you're right. If if you've got a fan base already, some of them are married to you, so you can win. When you're married uh, versus dating, listen. When I was married, I was weighing 177 pounds. You know what I mean? I was looking good. I was on top of my game because uh, I'm dating. But now, when I got when I was dating and I just got married, now I'm thirty some years into it, and I'm not 177 pounds. <laughs> I'm on the middle of my game, and <laughs> um, but but the point is, I get away with stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I understand. You don't, you don't get away with stuff. Yeah, yeah. So so you really got to be on top of it, um, and that's where a lot of people. But my point is personality, some subtle things uh, visually. Um, and so there's a difference between uh, being live on video and being live on stage and the aspect of uh, connecting with your audience is a little different. Yeah, yeah, well, talking to a camera is a little, little different. Yeah. Yeah, it's a talent in itself. Um, now, um, before we finish up, I just want each one of you, I'll start with Michelle, maybe just give me three points in this whole conversation we're having. What are well, three things you can think of? Well, I think eye contact 
Uh, and even for me, when I, because my gigs are smaller, I make sure that I, I uh, go and connect with the people before I go on stage. They mm. already know who I am. They like me. I sit down with people. I talk with them. Um, and so I really engage and also making eye contact with people on stage enough of this, you know, so many people sing with their eyes closed and uh, it's really, you know, so that that would be the big thing I, I would do is just really loving your audience and letting them know about it. That would be what, what I would say. Is that, is that one or two? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kevin, what about you? What's give me three things take home. I, I think uh, I hear this often. I've been asked this question a lot. How do I stop my stage fright? Mm. and yeah. my response back to them all the time is prepare like crazy mm -hmm. half the half the fear comes from not really knowing what to say in between songs i'm nervous i don't know the songs well enough if you prepare your show and it becomes rote and it becomes muscle memory mm -hmm. the now you're actually able to love your audience and sing better and and connect with people you've gotta you've gotta make sure you're prepared um, yeah can, can you really over prepare really no no, exactly. No, I worked on I worked on this one girl's show. We did a hundred hours for a thirty minute showcase. Mm -hmm. She killed it, but she said that I didn't even think on stage. I was just looked at people and loved and have. So prepare. You got to be prepared. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I learned many many years ago, um, it was to relax on stage and be okay with blowing it, mm -hmm. because I started to realize when I sucked vocally was usually when I connected with people. Mm -hmm. So the nights I started to feel good, I started to get a little bit arrogant thinking, oh, I'm in mean, good voice. This is going to be so good. People are going to be so impressed. People don't care how well or bad you sing. They care if you love them. Mm -hmm. And I started realizing as good or as bad as I can sing on any given night has no bearing on the level of my ministry and connection. Mm -hmm. I have to go out there and love on people and realize anything that's going to happen tonight that's good only happens because... I serve the creator mm -hmm. and that calmed me down. And I was able to do 60 day tours without any worry about, Oh, I don't have the great voice tonight. Eh, so what do the best I can, but it's about people. So yeah. Yeah. prepare go, and realize I'm, you can't be good enough to impress anybody. Sorry, Michelle. I'm going to go back to do my number three. I get Okay. So number okay. one, I engage the audience beforehand. I make sure you do lots of eye contact, blah, 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 blah. blah. And number three is I might be the only person that I know that has never had stage fright. Mm -hmm. And so for me to practice too much would be a huge, I would be like Lucille Ball going out there trying to, because I do not have good uh, recall. I, I, I can never memorize anything. <laughs> Tom's laughing at me. I can never memorize anything. So I would make a complete mess of it. So there might be a few of you out there who are the same. I have no fear of being on stage and I have no idea why. Pass again. You know what I, I learned that really helped my career? I started to focus in on who I was and what people knew me as. Huh. Um, I started out as a heavy metal singer and was in a pop rock band and then was doing sort of pop. And then I started doing churches because I was starting to make a living doing this, realizing I can't do these things. So I was dressing and acting like I was signed kind of here. But when I started to do Gaither dates, people started to think of me in a certain way. Mm -hmm. and so I realized I actually started to embrace that, realize, okay, I, I'm going to dress differently. I'm going to be respond differently. I'm going to focus in on, those people know me as this. I need to brand myself as this. I can't mm -hmm. be the guy that sings rock and Southern gospel. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. focus in in this area. And what I started realizing is my sales went up. My response went up. I looked and I acted and visually it represented the music better than what I was doing previously. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's some, there's some confusion when visually it doesn't <laughs> add up to what the, what the sonic sound is like and so but there's wisdom in that kevin there's wisdom in that because you uh, you're engaging with a certain target audience and then you're going to sell more merch you're going to make those moments create that that bridge and so it that's did really actually vital. it made a difference in my bottom line every show mm -hmm. i prepared like that my bottom line was different mm -hmm. i wasn't disingenuous it was who i was but i was just i was thinking it through a little you bit you were better. focused though you were focused on what needed to work um okay tom what about you three things well, let me say this, first of all, I've had a lot, a lot of fun. It's been great. Um, I was laughing, Michelle, because 
Probably you and I are the only people in the world that know who Lucille Ball is. No, I watch <laughs> Lucille Ball all the time. Hey, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you watch, you know, old old t time TV. Yeah. Uh, I've been married uh, 52 years, okay? <laughs> <laughs> And and you are and you are a little bit like Lucille Ball. <laughs> Lucy, oh, you have some explain in the do. Yeah, um, that's funny. So I got a good time here, and let me just say this: and this is going to sound self-serving, but one of the things that drives me crazy, and 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 I know this is just the format it is, is people want me to to come on and give them some tips. You know, tips, give them the three tips they're going to, and they're going to take this away. And, and here's what I say. Tips are for waiters and waitresses. <laughs> if you want, if you want tips, go become a waiter or waitress. If okay. you want to do this for a living, buy my materials. True. And, and listen, I would send you to, I, listen, I've lived in New York, I've lived in LA, I've lived in Nashville, I'm in Florida right now because my summer home or my winter home, whatever home it is. Um, but no, this is a method. This is something you need to put in your head. That's like saying, okay, what are the three tips to, to get to know Jesus? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like, that's insanity. It, not that I'm Jesus or my stuff is as important, but the point is, you got to get in your closet. You got to read the word. You got to mm -hmm. study. You've got to, you got to get to church. You got to get, in other words, it's, it's a, it's as you would say in Canada, a process. Um, <laughs> and it is. And yeah. so, so to me, I, I, I tend to avoid giving tips. I well, most, appreciate that. Well, I take all my tips back just for that. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, just, just in that note, I want to remind people that if they go to the gospel music industry hub.com, um, there is a code there which you can pick up and go to um, Tom Jackson's uh, website and he will give you 25% off of his merchandise. So that's something that Cheryl and I have negotiated with uh, Tom's <laughs> wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So Susan was able to make that uh, for you who are watching right now. Just to the end, the end of July, is that right, Cheryl? Just to the end of July, to July 31st. Well, I, I, want, I want to say this one thing, though, to go along with what Kevin said, and he's, he's right, because he was talking about being prepared and being prepared and being prepared. And, and confidence does come from preparation, no question about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but the question is, if you don't know what to prepare for, that goes back to the materials. It's like, yeah, what am I preparing? Does that mean going into getting a vocal coach 40 hours a week? Well, the truth is, that's not, I'm, listen, I'm all for vocal coaches, but that's not going to make the difference in your live show. And if you have a vocal coach that says they can help you with your live show, run. Because, seriously, because, because that's not their gig. One of my biggest pet peeves is, in the in music is oh, going here's a reference do you guys remember mr haney green acres oh yeah yeah uh, mr haney could do everything <laughs> i can do that can you can you be a vocal coach uh, i can do that can you produce a record uh, i can do that and the truth is everything he did was terrible <laughs> now so you sticking in your lane is a pet peeve i, I, I want to get off subject here but preparation is massive. But you know, you got to know what you're preparing for, and mm -hmm. and and prepare. But I want to go, and I'll close with this. On top, on top of here's here's confidence. Imagine a block. On top of confidence is another block, and that's called authority. Mm -hmm. And authority comes from on high. But. You've got to believe that authority. Authority comes from the inside out. You've got to get on your knees and wrestle with yourself and, and wrestle with God and say, is this really what I'm supposed to do before the world? See, I'm a simple guy. I don't care where, when I get a call to, to teach, when I get a call to work with an artist, I believe I'm supposed to be there. Just like you, Mr. and Mrs. Artist, you get a call to sing on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, whatever it is, before the world was formed, our Ephesians says, for the world was formed, God ordained you to be on that stage. 
It's not an accident. So if you don't walk in that room with authority, th then your, your audience is missing out. But real authority comes from humility. And real humility is accepting the role that God has called you to. So he's opened that door. Real humility is going out and bringing it instead of false humility. I'll just be humbled, stand up here and sing because, uh, you know, I don't want to draw attention to myself. Well, the irony is you stand up there and you're so humble on stage, you're nervous that you draw attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah. it's like a weird paradox. So real authority, you need to not only have confidence, you need to have authority when you walk on that stage and that authority comes from humility wrestling with yourself walking in the building and it's and 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 owning it and here's the problem you will get criticized but you, here's my my point you're already getting criticized for doing nothing you might as well get criticized for doing something mm, mm, mm. and that's my well that's, okay. Okay. that's my story and i'm sticking to it as they say here in nashville that's great. Awesome stuff. Well, I have had a phenomenal night. This has been amazing. I was just going to say, this has been rich. Um, I'm just saying right now, viewers, um, we have been talking with Kevin Pauls, Michelle Sim, and Tom Jackson about improving your stage presence. If you have missed a majority of this conversation, you need to hit the rewind button. <laughs> oh, I guess that doesn't exist anymore. You need to wait until we can load this back up on uh, YouTube so you can watch this over and over and over again because this has been a rich conversation. And this is only skimming the top. Yeah. It's yeah. only skimming the top. Um, as was mentioned earlier, if you missed it, um, Tom Jackson, who is, who is, I'm not sure what I should say anymore. His, his, his website is onstagesuccess.com and you can go in there and look at all his different merchandise. But if you go to gospelmusicindustry.com, there's a special code which entitles for you to get a 25% discount off of some of his merchandise. So please take advantage of that if you can. And invest, yeah. And not only that, we do have another discount. We still have another one from a previous show for uh, Lewitt microphones, and we only have a couple more days for that. So if you are interested in ordering your Lewitt microphones, we only have till July 2nd. Um, again, if you don't have the code, go to gospelmusicindustryhub.com. And if you've already subscribed, you will have that code with you. If not, we will send that code to you once you send us your email address. So other than that, I just wanna say thank you, uh, panelists. Um, Kevin, Michelle, Tom, you guys are a blessing. You guys are absolutely awesome. And gal, of course, <laughs> you know, um, Dale, thank you again for being my co-host and wonderful. You're welcome. Viewer. Hey. <laughs> and viewers, thank you for being here with us. And next week we're back again, uh, with more panelists and more great topics. And we want you to, we want to see you next week. Yeah. That's right. that's so thanks for joining us and have a good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye.